Welcome to the Moral News for the seven days ending on April 14, 2023. We've just got to share a few items with you this week. First of all, there was a fantastic article written by Megan Basham at the AmericanReformer.org where she goes into what happened uh, with Rick Warren and the Southern Baptist Convention and all the maneuverings over there. Let's just take a look at it and then we'll talk about it. So that was how that title came about, um, Mr. Smith Goes to the Convention. So, you know, Mike Law was this small uh, small church pastor in Arlington, Virginia, and he started a constitutional amendment. He proposed uh, last year at the convention, why don't we have a constitutional amendment because there's a lot of chaos and confusion over this issue of women in the pulpit. So here's an easy way to address it, and then we can hash it out and we can debate it on the floor. And kind of what I traced through the article was how that did not end up happening. Mm -hmm. Through a lot of um, backroom dealing, essentially the issue came down to celebrity pastor Rick Warren throwing his weight around, being given um, really sort of stunning uh, privilege that nobody, no, yeah. certainly a, a pastor of a small church in Virginia is not going to get right. to advocate for having women pastors. And so instead of having this very clear vote on should we, the Southern Baptist Convention, have women pastors or not, they they kicked Rick Warren out, but they kicked him out for the purpose of allowing him to appeal. So what it looks like it's shaping up is that sort of laws amendment has been pushed by the wayside, and instead we're going to have a vote on whether we like Rick Warren and want to keep Rick Warren in the Southern Baptist Convention, and that will set the precedent for whether or not we have women pastors in the SBC. Well, <laughs> then it turns out um, his church, Saddleback, has now brought in a ministry called Embracing the Journey. Um, this happened two years before Rick Warren left. So I, I'm going to assume it was not a surprise to Rick Warren. If you go to their website, at least this morning, just now, you will see a link to this ministry. So it was not a surprise to Saddleback that one of their pastors was doing this. Well, it's a ministry for parents of LGBTQ kids. And what it has is if, if you go to this ministry, you will find all kinds of really hard, openly affirming, hard left um, gay activists, people like mm. Matthew Vines, if right. you're familiar with him, yes, uh, Justin Lee. Um, so a lot of people like that who are not, you know, these aren't people where you're having to read tea leaves to figure out where they stand. They are very openly militant gay activists who mm -hmm. want to bring um, full LGBTQ inclusion into the church, and they're not shy about that. So if you heard those two clips, she sort of outlined what happened at first, and then uh, so the whole deal was to so get Rick Warren in a position where he can appeal this so they can make the issue about about Rick Warren and not about women pastors. But the second clip, you must have noticed that that had to do with her connecting the dots between uh, we have this incoming uh, LGBT thing going on with the Saddleback Church. And so, wow, it looks like uh, instead of Rick Warren just being one more uh, super biblical uh, person there, and in fact, they are engaged in bringing in all this nonsense too. You could see it in the the ministry that she mentioned. So, anyway, interesting piece. Really like Megan Basham and her clear eyed view on this stuff. Okay, let's go to the next one. I want to look with you today at just a little bit about what's going on with the Methodists. Uh, there's been kind of a continuous burning down of the Methodist Church with the incursion of the LGBT thing. And now they are have lost thousands of, of congregations and are moving to a new group, a new group called the Global Methodist. Let's look at it. Brutal. That's how one minister described his congregation's departure from the United Methodist Church. And it's part of a growing trend. One of the nation's largest Protestant denominations in America has lost nearly 2,000 congregations. I recently traveled to Texas where a number of churches are joining a new Methodist movement. Looking at what I believe is going to be the future of the United Methodist Church, I didn't really see a place for me uh, in, in the United Methodist Church. Pastor Howard Hun says his embrace of scripture helped him make the decision. What I believe scripture very clearly teaches that uh, human sexuality is, is a gift from God reserved for a husband and wife, a man and a woman, uh, in a monogamous marriage. According to the denomination's General Council on Finance and Administration, 
more than 1,800 U.S. churches have left the denomination since 2019. More than 1,200 congregations have joined the new theologically conservative Global Methodist denomination, which launched last May. The third thing I want to bring your attention to is that the FBI, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, has uh, been investigating radicalized, what they call radicalized Catholics. Uh, now, there maybe there are some radicalized Catholics, but uh, can you imagine the FBI sending people into your churches to, to kind of spy on people and find the most conservative ones uh, and make a list of those people? Look, look at this. Congressman Jim Jordan tells me he wants to see the unredacted version of the FBI memo. So what was the FBI looking for? Jordan says what agents called radical traditional Catholics. But who they were going after were pro-life Catholics. Pro-life people, pro-life people in the Catholic Church. You can tell because some of the footnotes talk about in the aftermath of the Dobbs decision. The Ohio Republican doubts his committee would have found out about this, much less stop it without the whistleblower's help. Just a month ago, Attorney General Merrick Garland testified that the DOJ has no anti-Catholic bias. Attorney General, are you cultivating sources and spies in Latin mass parishes and other Catholic parishes around the country? No, the Justice Department does not do that. It is important to note that I did contact Bishop Barry Nestout out of the Richmond, Virginia Diocese, where according to the FBI memo, FBI agents were undercover inside of his churches. Now he called the leaked memo troubling and offensive to all communities of faith, and he says that it is a threat to religious liberties. So the last piece I want to bring to you today, and, and you know, I get to pick things out because this is, you know, my moral news. So I'm going to bring you a little, uh, I'm going to read you some bits finally here out of Joseph Booth. He wrote an article called The Pulpit, Pastors, and Culture. Uh, just a very deep uh, and strong Christian line here. I hope you can endure this. This is a long, two paragraphs. I'll give you the long one at first and then the second one. But listen to his analysis of our culture and where things are going. We are living in a collectivist age. Individual people are increasingly lost in the mass of news media, the anonymity of social media, the crowd of progressive movements, and among the people. It is an age of totalizing politics where the messianic state must act as savior to the public from cradle to grave. God's image bearers are viewed merely as abstractions known only by group identities and the degree to which, as a class, they feel oppressed or victimized by the majority. There is a grand leveling underway. The democratization of human beings as mere variables in an equation of or cogs in a machine and the spiritual uprooting of the individual before the living God. This leveling has shattered family, community, social and national life, a sense of individual accountability to God and personal responsibility for oneself and others has largely dissipated. Western civilization has emphatically broken up. Its religious unity shredded while neo- Pagan ideologies have risen. The younger generation is rudderless, confused, and tempted to despair. Little wonder, since for much of their lives, our young people have been treated like laboratory animals in an ideological sexual social experiment. That's paragraph one. Now, uh, I'm going to skip, and every, every line is, is worthy, but I'm going to skip down here to the three things he says that we need to have. I would summarize our threefold apologetic task in the pulpit in this way. Rooted in Scripture, we must critique the supposed autonomous neo-pagan secular systems of thought and ways of life that destroy man's life and lead only to despair. Two, to prepare the would-be believer to take the step of faith in committing the totality of their life to Christ and His Lordship, tearing down all their hiding places. And three, train believers in setting all the aspects of their life and thought in relation to the absolute claims and lordship of Jesus Christ. Uh, so this is, you can find this article at EzraInstitute.com. And uh, Joseph Booth, he lives in Canada, which probably helps him see more clearly the, the total incursion of the state. But uh, anything Joe Booth writes, uh, B-O-T, -B -O -O April 11, 2023, this article, anything he writes, is worth your time as as a deep diving you know i want to be a full-blown christian for jesus and and not fold to the secular culture awesome business hey friends this is the 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 moral news for this seven days ending april 14th